you can see everything, yes. So I would like to start my lecture with a quote. Uh, with a quote from Hermann Josef, who was the former camp elder in Thurston Grube, a satellite camp of uh, Auschwitz Monowitz. And he, uh, in 1986, you know, 68, he wrote with regards to a um, process was, which was conducted against him. Um, he said, uh, he, in this letter, he said that uh, once he told um, a judge during this process, uh, since he was in Auschwitz, um, he became accustomed to wondering when he met a person in everyday life, uh, or a person he encountered, what he had done in the camp. He was imagining what could have uh, this person been, which kind of person in the camp. And then I, Hermann Josef, would rank him based on my experiences with people in the camps." End quote. So then the judge, after this uh, sentence, asked him uh, what um, I thought he would have been doing had he been in a concentration camp. And the answer by uh, Hermann Josef was, you might, have been, you might have become a block eltester, obsessed with absolute cleanliness. End quote. So the judge now seemed to be very satisfied with that until Josef gave the, uh, uh, added the following sentences. And I quote, do you know how you would have achieved the highest degree of cleanliness, end quote. So anyway, the question why normal or ordinary people are transformed into bad people in utterly situations <coughs> is a timeless and universal question. When it comes to that, with regards to the Holocaust, the role of Jewish functionaries, in my case here in camps, or the circumstances of one's survival, <coughs> so um, Holocaust scholars try since decades to explain human behavior. How did someone survive and was he or she in a privileged position? Or what kind of capo had one been? Behind that, stand broader interests regarding the human mind. So, what is a human, how many faces does he have, and what <coughs> abysses are in his heart? A common answer, and okay, I know I might make a very complicated and complex story very short now, is the approach to identify individual personal qualities that led to a certain behavior. In scholarly, scholarly articles, and um, my background is also that uh, more than 10 years I worked in an editing project on the history uh, of concentration camps at the Center for Research on Antisemitism in Berlin. And uh, it's only about the concentration camps and not the forced labor camps for Jews and others. So the, um, normally the functionary's behavior, behavioral repertoire varies from altruism to forced coercion to sadistic torture up to murder. <coughs> so, but in the aftermath of the Holocaust, also the judges were challenged. I give you one example of one individual person and, and I will come back to him later. The Jewish functionary Abraham Stuttmann, who was transferred in 1944 from Birkenau um, via uh, the Stutthof uh, main camp to the satellite to two satellite camps of Natzweiler was charged because of manslaughter, but the punishment of the court was later reduced because of positive acts. For example, they said the judges said, uh, "Okay, he, on the one hand in Birkenau he um, pushed someone to death, to death." And then later on in Heilfingen, a uh, satellite camp of Natzweiler, he feeded prisoners, he cared for, um, so that they had the possibility to wash themselves and so on. But in both cases, what I wanted to demonstrate, as well as in academic research, as in the courtroom, situational and env environmental influences which of course shifted over time, are only taken into account rudimentarily. So it's mainly focused on the personal structure of an individual. So, but thanks to psychologist scholarship after the war's end, of course, for example, the well-known Milgram or Stanford prisoner experiments, and the prisoner experiment was that one, um, only as a reminder, where within uh, six days the students um, 
um, uh, in this experiment turned into brutal guards who ruled over others. So uh, thanks to psychologist scholarship ship after the war's end, um, the simplifying ap approach, individual choices, was widened. But until recently, there is no comprehensive study on Jewish functionaries, and only a few articles and one book has been published. All of the men, um, with one exception, a self um, no a memoir of the Holocaust. This was. Um, from Isabella Leitner, who was uh, the camp elder in one of the um, Schmelt camps in East Upper Schlesia. Then we have this research of Tuvia Freeling and uh, two Israeli researchers on uh, Elisa Grünbaum, um, who was a capo in Birkenau. And uh, both books focus on this individual history, um, also uh, that he was a Zionist and so on. Then we have a study about Josef Weiss, the camp elder in Bern Belsen. Then we have the research of Rivka Boot, Christopher Browning, and um, Zari Siegel, who just uh, defended her uh, thesis at Wolf's, with Wolf Gruner some weeks or months ago, I've heard. Months ago. Yeah. Sorry? Some months ago. Some months ago, yes. So, um, so the question is, in the background, of course, I've heard it from uh, um, visitors. In I have been in a project, and we have been in the Western Borg Memorial um, uh, site. And the question is, why is it important at all to explain or describe the behavior of Jewish functionaries? They were human beings. They were good and bad, and something in between. But I am convinced that we, as historians, it, uh, today, if we mention it at all, try not to judge. But we have to ask ourselves what legacy we want to give to future generations who see and observe the results of our research. For example, exactly in exhibitions or projects dedicated to the public. And I think at the, pu the public, yes, you know what I mean, definitely will ask questions like, was he or she good or bad, what do you think, how do you explain this, how do you judge this, or do you judge this, and so on. And this was um, exactly the case in 2016 when the curators of the Westerbork Memorial in the Netherlands opened the first exhibition dealing with the guards of the transit camp um, Westerbork, of which the Jewish Ordnungsdienst was a part of. And the, there, the Jewish Ordnungsdienst was regarded as part of the guards. Yeah. So now, to come back to this uh, Lucifer effect, the U.S. American social, social psychologist um, Philip Zimbardo, who was the initiator of the Stanford Prison Experiment, and after 2003 testified for the defense of one of the guards um, who uh, tortured prisoners in the um, Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq, stated the following, and I quote, given violent behavior, one searches for sadistic personality traits. Given heroic deeds, the search is one for genes that predispose towards altruism, end quote. But, and this is why I like this picture so very much, in the beginning. Naturally, most of the behavior uh, or the barrier between good and evil is permeable. And I think you can see that there are black bats and white angels. And I didn't see it in the beginning, I must say. I only saw the black um, bats. <laughs> I don't know what that means. I don't want to know. But <laughs> so. <laughs> but I like the picture, so I took it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah this, I only saw it later. <laughs> so, shall I leave it that you can watch it a little more? But I'll come back to the end. So, so according to Zimbardo's theory, individual behavior in extreme situations, again, a long story short, can only sufficiently be explained by dispositional, situational, and systemic factors that then by individual choices. Uh, an approach which is far too monolithic or simplifying, as not only the individual choices. Now, finally, come, coming back to the camps. 
Keeping in mind that the Nazi camp system was consciously designed so that collaboration, or if you wanted cooperation, by its victims were considered was considered right from the beginning. Um, no, sorry. So keeping in mind that the Nazi camp system was consciously designed so that collaboration, cooperation by its victims was considered right from the beginning. We understand stand the grey zone, that this was a natural component of the camps. Isabella Leitner, whose memoirs I mentioned before, stated, um, well aware of the ambulance of her position, she was a camp elder in a uh, Schmelkamp, which was, uh, the name was Birnbaum, she quoted the following. The German genius knew variations of the evil. One was, the t one was to choose the torturers from among the inmates, brother against brother, sister against sister, end quote. So against Zimbardo's approach to analyze the uh, dispositional, the situational and systemic factors that led to the outcome of behavior, it would be in my eyes promising to read the small amount of self-accounts of prisoners, functionaries themselves, or to uh, analyze survivor testimonies against his theory. Um, because I think that many Holocaust survivors testify about respective functionaries. They focus most often on a narrow outcome of behavior, either the hero who acted altruistic or the sadistic capo who acted on his or his own subgroup's volition, without mentioning the specific atmosphere at the given point in time. And just yesterday afternoon, I, um, I, in Haifa, I met um, a woman who is 90 today, and she was liberated in Berlin, she was in Auschwitz and deported to Berlin. And of course I took the possibility uh, to ask her if she had any experiences with Kapos or Stubenälteste and so on. And then she uh, told me about a woman who guarded uh, the transport from the Wutsch ghetto to Birkenau and then to uh, later on, I think, I'm not sure, to Berlin. And um, then she was very brutal and hit the prisoner, the women and so on, and the small girls. And um, then she added the sentence in the end, I quote. And only today I understand her behavior. Doesn't matter now if this is true or not, no, but this is what she said. Only today I understand her behavior. It was because her parents were shot in front of her eyes in the Wutsch ghetto, end quote. And I found several other testimonies in which survivors focus not only on single, one single event which was triggered by a perverted personality structures. So, and um, how many minutes are left? Five. Five, okay. Five. So I give you, um, so I did not yet start really my research. I, uh, just yesterday I talked about a research project with someone here uh, from a college about this, but um, uh, for example, um, I found it interesting, uh, there is this uh, uh, self-account by Kurt Schlesinger, uh, uh, part of the so-called Ordnungsdienst in the Westerbork Transit Camp, and he is reported uh, in, after the Holocaust, um, oh no, he was the head of the Jewish Ordnungsdienst. Uh, in, in, his, in this post by account, he refers to the origins and causes of digitomies which occurred during the times of the per persecution of the Jews in the Netherlands. And it's very interesting, this account, because um, um, he um, uh, describes in detail the changes over time in the Netherlands and in the camp and how this had an influence on the social structure among the prisoners and why and how animosities appeared. So I just started to um, search in the uh, Shoah Foundation interviews um, for uh, testimonies um, of survivors uh, trying to find out at which, uh, no, about which given point in time they report and so on. Um, I will not go into detail now. And this is another example of uh, Abraham Stutman, whom I uh, mentioned in the beginning. And he was um, uh, from Płock, which is Poland. Um, then it was Poland? Yes. Płock. Płock, yeah, Płock, thank you. And he was deported to Birkenau and later on transferred to Stutthof and um, Haslach and Halfingen, 
Natzweiler satellite camps. And um, I told you that he was accused because of murder and then he had some positive uh, personality. Um, it was said in the court that he uh, also did some, some things in, for the prisoners and so on. And what I found interesting are these pictures because uh, this picture is taken right after liberation in the uh, French zone of occupation. And this is what the memorial site uh, of Natzweiler uses for um, uh, he was a capo, he was not a higher functionary. And this uh, on the right side is uh, exactly two years after liberation when he um, was applying for um, um, Hilfskomitee, to, was applying for help from the French allies. And um, now I'm again trying to find out what happened when and uh, I have the court files, but I would like to um, analyze the survivor testimonies when, when appeared this, his behavior in which context. I mean it's not so easy because normally the survivors do not say this was in April 1934 and on this and that day. But this, but I think if you are a little bit, um, uh, if you know how to work with survivor testimonies it will not be a big problem. But what's interesting, he had a, a fellow prisoner, Leo Katz, and until today he doesn't speak with the memorial site, <laughs> only with a lawyer. And I approached uh, this um, Leo Katz in 2016 to speak with me, and uh, he, um, of course, he said no, and his wife said he's, um, he's ill and he's old and he was a victim and so on. But what I would like to do, I would like to, um, I know that there are several uh, testimonies and self-accounts by former um, functionaries left and always is, these are the families who say no, we don't want to open it uh, to the public. But I think this is uh, the problem <coughs> because I really think that uh, these, um, these voices of these people are missing because um, we, of course, we have the perpetrators, we have the prisoners, the victims, and so on. But as I said in the beginning, um, the camp system was as such built uh, with collaboration, or however you want to call it. And I think the voices are missing, um, missing because uh, the functionaries are, in my as crystallization points, uh, that the Holocaust and its inherent social mechanisms was full of grey zones. And it was not the exception, it was the... Bull. No. Yeah. Um, there were not only um, individual uh, or ordinary people and heroes. So uh, I think I have 10 seconds le okay. left and I <laughs> go back to the picture. It's very fascinating and thank you very much for listening. <laughs> thank you. Yes.